Hello everyone, I hope you've been having a nice week so far. Welcome back to The Hidden Island. One Piece is known for its exceptional world-building and ever-growing cast of characters that are, for the most part, well thought out, varied, and creative in their design. When it comes to world-building especially, it's no secret that Oda likes to make references to some of our own mythology and folktales in his story. But did you know that Oda has also taken an incredible amount of inspiration from the events of the real-world Pirate Age, that on our very Earth there was a real Grand Line, a real Pirate King, and a real One Piece? Sure, some of the obvious comparisons, like Blackbeard's namesake, have been common knowledge for a long time, but I think you'd be surprised at the level of historical detail that Oda's included in his work. And I want to analyze that with you guys. So, for today, let's examine our own history and compare it to the One Piece world. I expect that you guys will already know some of this stuff, but my hope is that you'll come away from this video with even more. And if you do learn something new, let me know by giving this video a like and subscribing to The Hidden Island for more One Piece content. Sound good? Okay, so piracy as a concept and practice has been around for nearly as long as humans have been traveling on the sea. But the era of piracy between the 17th and 18th centuries is the one that inspired the romanticized, eyepatch-wearing, swashbuckling pirate imagery we are most familiar with, and this era known as the Golden Age of Piracy is the one that One Piece takes the greatest inspiration from. Even the nature of the Grand Line has its parallels in the real-world Caribbean Sea where most of the Golden Age took place. Being close to the equatorial belt and in the heart of the American continents made it possible to sail and encounter almost any type of climate or condition. Between the indigenous peoples and the various colonizers of Europe, almost any island or port you stopped by was likely to have different cultures and customs within. Frequent tropical storms and rough waters where the ocean meets the sea made the Caribbean a potentially dangerous place to sail as well. Even the Bermuda Triangle, which the Florian Triangle was based off of, resides in the Caribbean. With so much unexplored land, tales of cities of gold, ghost ships, and sea monsters were all a reality as far as sailors back then were concerned. People with dreams setting out from home, pirates making names for themselves, and prices being placed upon their heads were not uncommon. If you're looking for a real-life Grand Line, this was it. The discovery of the Americas, then known as the New World, prompted a lot of trade, colonization, and exploration from European countries. It was a very far and dangerous land with new and harsh conditions, but it was rich in gold, silver, and other important sparkly things, making it well worth the risk. Once word got around, many European countries would settle there, competing with each other for resources. Governors in the Caribbean hired crews of hunters and sailors experienced in naval combat known as buccaneers, for the sole purpose of raiding and pillaging merchant ships from enemy countries. Sounded like a great idea, until those buccaneers stopped caring about whose flag was on the ships they attacked, and they just started robbing everybody. This caught on quickly, and thus the infamous Golden Age of Piracy was born, with soon over 5,000 pirates out at sea at any given time. In order to counter this, a new type of profession was born in the form of privateers, armed sailors who were, by all stretches of the imagination, also pirates. However, these guys were privately owned by European nations, mostly the British, issued letters by the Admiralty of the British Navy exempting them from being accused of piracy. Essentially, they were given a license to kill as officially sanctioned pirates of the government. In other words, privateers were the real-life equivalent of the Seven Warlords. So, why did people become pirates? Well, much like in One Piece, they were typically people in search of glory and getting rich quick. Oftentimes, pirates started out as ill-paid workers, tradesmen, and farmers who were forced off their land or bankrupted by big businesses. They would flock to the coastal cities seeking work, sometimes find themselves on the dock, and other times find themselves unemployed. Overcrowding, poverty, bad government, and social discontentment made this issue even greater, and with few ways to make ends meet, many people found themselves being drawn to the sea. If they weren't going to be paid what they needed to survive, they were going to go take it themselves. And so they went. Occasionally, they would even hit it big, make a ton of money, and quit being a pirate right then and there. After all, many of them were only in it to make ends meet. In some cases, they successfully retired. In others, they were executed. But while being a pirate could be profitable if you were lucky, many of them were well aware that their days were numbered. They were very ready to die young, and thus black flags of pirates oftentimes featured an hourglass, symbolizing a grim limit on both your time and their time alike. 
This is something you can actually see referenced in One Piece on Don Krieg's flag. The standard pirate skull and crossbones, or full-on skeleton, was a more common thing to appear on a real pirate flag, and interestingly so was the color red. In fact, a blood-red pirate flag was even more dangerous than a black flag, as the red flag indicated a take-no-prisoners approach, and meant that those with it were planning to kill with zero discretion. Thus, the name for the pirate flag, Joli Rouge, a French term meaning pretty red. This telephoned over time between scurvy sea dogs and non-French illiterates until Jolie Rouge became Jolly Roger, which, funnily enough, means that both Roger and his wife Rouge have the same namesake. So there you have the quick and easy history lesson on the archetypical pirate, and I hopefully laid it out in a way where you can already see the inspiration that Oda took from real world events. It's one of the more interesting parts in history in my opinion, and while the real thing was a lot more dark and brutal than in the world of One Piece, it was nevertheless an era defined by wild freedom, exploration, and imagination. But when it comes to referencing the real thing, Oda didn't stop there. To exemplify this, I think it would be fun to go over all the other real-life pirates, explorers, and criminals connected to our favorite One Piece characters. So let's start with the fun fact. All of the supernovas introduced on the Sabaody Archipelago barring Killer are based on real-life pirates and criminals. In case you're wondering about Killer, Oda said in an SBS that he chose the name out of sheer laziness. Anyway, we'll start with his captain, Eustace Kidd, whose first name likely comes from the medieval pirate Eustace the Monk. And his surname, more importantly, comes from one of the most famous figures in pirate history, Captain William Kidd. Contrary to popular belief, most pirates didn't actually bury their treasure most pirates. Captain Kidd, however, did. Interestingly, Oda stated that if Eustace Kidd were to be born from a country on Earth, he would be from Scotland. Scotland also happens to be where the real Captain Kidd is from. Trafalgar Law's name comes from a famous naval battle during the Napoleonic Wars called the Battle of Trafalgar. Law is romanized in Japanese as Ro, which makes sense considering the inspiration for his surname comes from Edward Lowe, a notoriously brutal pirate who operated in the Caribbean. Both grew up in poverty and very unfortunate conditions, and both became pirates after losing a loved one. Lowe's brutal history may have directly inspired Law's design and reputation for cruelty as the surgeon of death in One Piece, considering the guy became a warlord by delivering the hearts of 100 pirates to the world government. Gruesome story but the real low was said to have removed the hearts of an entire crew of Spanish officers and even partook in eating some, which is especially cruel and horrible for even the standards of pirates. Next up, a more obvious one being Capone Gang Beige, whose likeness is not from a pirate, but from the real-life notorious gangster Al Capone. Both dominated their respective territories as mafia bosses and utilized cold execution to take down rival families. In Beige's case, he got bored of winning so much in the West Blue that he decided to become a pirate instead. Al Capone wasn't as fortunate. Scratchman Apu has a strong resemblance to Chui Apu, a famous pirate in the 19th century who dominated the ocean around southern China. Ironically, Scratchman Apu turned out to be a trader working for Kaido, while the real-life Apu was ultimately betrayed by his own crew and handed over to the authorities. Jewelry Bonnie takes direct inspiration from Anne Bonnie, one of the most infamous female pirates on record. The real Bonnie actually worked aboard the ship of another pirate, Calico Jack. Calico Jack, by the way, is the namesake behind Brooke's former captain, Calico Yorkie. Both Jewelry and Anne Bonnie had bright hair, fiery personalities, and were known to disguise themselves. Jewelry can disguise herself through changing her age, whereas Anne would disguise herself as a man when aboard Jack's ship. Mad Monk Rouge gets his name from one of the famous Barbarossa pirates, Arouge Race, a Muslim corsair who operated in the Mediterranean Sea and practically dominated those waters, along with his brother Hazir, who we'll get to later. Some of the other supernovas don't really share anything with their namesake aside from, well, their name. Zoro's surname, Roronoa, comes from the French pirate Francois Lolonois, which Japanese people pronounce the exact same way. Lolonois becomes Rodonoa. That's where the comparisons end, though. Another example like this is Basil Hawkins, whose name comes from the naval commander, slave trader, and privateer John Hawkins. Not much else to say about this guy, though. However, Hawkins happens to be the second cousin of Sir Francis Drake, the inspiration behind the name Diaz Drake. The real Drake was likewise a naval officer and privateer most known for circumnavigating the world and being the first to survive doing so. Famous explorer Ferdinand Magellan would have gotten that credit had he not died part of the way through his journey, having to be succeeded by his crew. Speaking of which, that's where this guy's name comes from. Okay, 
Okay, so the supernovas are named after many of the most famous pirates and privateers in history, but is there more? Why, yes. Yes, there is. A lot more. Captain Morgan gets his name from... You guessed it, Captain Morgan, also known as Henry Morgan. Funnily enough, Axe Hand Morgan went from governing a town to becoming a criminal, right? Henry Morgan, on the other hand, did the exact opposite. He started as a pirate, a criminal, and then later went on to govern a town successfully. Cavendish shares his name with English explorer and privateer Thomas Cavendish, and both of them coincidentally spent most of their cushy early life living in luxury. Then there's Redleg Zeph, who gets his name from Redleg's Greaves. Silver's Rayleigh likely gets the silver in his name from the famous main antagonist of the 1882 novel Treasure Island, Long John Silver. Rayleigh may be a reference to Sir Walter Rayleigh, and this is a name only, and in fact Sir Walter Rayleigh seems to have more in common with Mont Blanc Nolan than with the Dark King, as he was an explorer who led expeditions into the New World in search of El Dorado, the City of Gold. He made a grave mistake, however, on one of his expeditions and was beheaded back home by his king as a result. A bit on the nose there, huh? Taking a look at the privateers of One Piece, the Seven Warlords, we can already spot a couple of references to other pirates from our world. Bartholomew Kuma gets his name from Bartholomew Roberts, also known as Black Bart, one of the first people to adopt the skull and crossbones flag and a man who was single-handedly the most successful pirate in the golden age of piracy, having taken over 400 prizes in successful raids during his career. Black Bart is also the inspiration behind the Bardo Club Pirates and their captain, Bartolomeo. As the wiki interestingly points out, when Bartholomew Roberts died, it marked the end of the golden age of piracy. In one piece, the Great Pirate Age ends during the Marine Ford arc, which also happens to be the same place where we learn that Bartholomew Kuma is effectively dead. Probably not intentional, but cool nonetheless. Given Kuma's interest in the Bible, it's possible his name also comes from Bartholomew the Apostle. While not a real person, Peter Pan's Captain Hook is the original character responsible for the stereotype of hook-handed pirates, something that we can see reflected in the One Piece character Crocodile. Funnily enough, Captain Hook lost his hand to a giant crocodile who liked the taste so much that he constantly chases the captain in hopes of eating the rest of him, something I'm 1000% sure Oda referenced intentionally. I'm also thoroughly convinced that the pirate empress Boa Hancock with her kingdom exclusive to women and locale heavily themed around Chinese architecture is primarily based off of the most successful female pirate in world history, Madame Cheng. Oftentimes, when pirates would stop at a port to resupply, they would also spend their money at brothels with ladies of the night. Cheng began her life working as a Cantonese prostitute who quickly rose through the ranks in her brothel by winning over the hearts of men. She was known especially for being very charming. From there, she used her feminine wiles and people skills to gather crews of men together, effectively crafting her own pirate crew. This attracted the attention of Chang Yi, another famous pirate who she later married to combine their forces. When Chang Yi died, Madame Cheng was left with the entire pie, a fleet made up of a whopping 60,000 men. She absolutely dominated the seas as a result and even gave trouble to entire empires through the sheer breadth of her power. She would come to earn the title of Pirate Queen, or Pirate Princess, similar to Boa's title of Pirate Empress. Interestingly, Cheng established a pirate code for her crew that prohibited the mistreatment or sexual abuse of women on threat of death, which, considering how Amazon Lily takes to men, seems very in line with something that Boa would do as well. On the subject of femme fatale, Lin Lin may have taken inspiration from Charlotte Badger, who was a real-life pirate that shared some other notable similarities with Big Mom. They were both separated from their parents at a young age, spent their childhood as convicts, and both raised a child during their career as a pirate. Charlotte Badger is also described on multiple accounts of being rather overweight. Charlotte de Berry is another potentially fictional female pirate who may have inspired the story of Big Mom, being that she similarly married many men over the course of her adventures. Even the members of the Blackbeard Pirates have names that connect back to our world. Jesus Burgess has a resemblance to Josiah Burgess, a real Caribbean pirate who at one point was intercepted by the real Blackbeard. Since they knew each other from working on the same ship in the past, Blackbeard bought some goods off him and let him go. Lafitte, in name, is a reference to Jean and Pierre Lafitte, two brothers who ran a pirate crew in the Gulf of Mexico. Pierre was especially known for his wit and charm, something that Oda's Lafitte seems to possess as well. Van Auger is a reference to the pirate John Auger, who at one point was also on the same ship as Josiah Burgess and Blackbeard. 
Avalo Pizarro and Vasco Schott are based on Francisco Pizarro and Vasco da Gama respectively, both historical figures noted to have led expeditions into the Indies. Both the fictional and real Pizarro in particular are known to have been exceptionally cruel. All this, and we still haven't even talked about their captain, the big one-man direct reference himself, Marshall D. Teach. With that, I want to begin a segment of this video where we take an in-depth look at the three biggest real-world references in the story. So I'm pretty sure you guys already know that the names Edward Newgate and Marshall D. Teach from One Piece's Whitebeard and Blackbeard respectively both come from the name of the real Blackbeard, Edward Teach. Edward Teach, also known as Blackbeard himself, is probably the single most famous pirate in history, despite not being the richest or the most successful. He was actually a really fascinating guy, and you'd be surprised at how well Oda has translated his story into One Piece so far. For example, both Blackbeards had brief careers as privateers at one point in their life, with one working for the British Navy and the other working as one of the Seven Warlords. Both the fictional and the real Teach started their pirate careers as an apprentice aboard a ship, with Marshall coming aboard Whitebeard's ship and Edward working alongside a Benjamin Hornigold. In both cases, their mentor and captain was deposed from their role and Teach would take over in their place. In One Piece, this was done through assassination, while in the real world, it was just done by vote. Not as dramatic. Just like Marshall, the real Blackbeard didn't always have a beard, but once he was placed in command, he decided he wanted to maintain a fearsome image to go along with his reputation. So, he decided to grow out a thick black beard that would cover his entire face, eventually getting so long that he would tie it into knots at each end. This is something that Oda even took the time to do in his story, as almost every time we see Teach, pre-time skip, his beard gets longer and longer. Both Blackbeards were also known to carry around multiple pistols at a time strapped to their chest, and both were also known to be incredibly devious and cunning individuals. Edward Teach was specifically infamous for the degree to which he would plan out his next moves and raids, something that earned him a fearsome reputation and the absolute confidence of his crew. We can see this in-depth, long-term planning and faith in Marshall D. Teach as well. The real Blackbeard would occasionally even kill his own men so that, quote, no one would forget who he was. One of the more interesting facts about the real Blackbeard was that he would tie hemp into his hair and light the wicks on fire before going into battle or boarding another pirate ship, making it look to others like smoke was constantly pluming out of his head. This would make other people think he was monstrous and inhuman, and tales of the smoke-headed demon Blackbeard would spread very quickly. Interesting how One Piece's Blackbeard also has a reputation for having a strange, maybe inhuman body, and even more interesting that when he uses his Yami Yami powers, it seems to conjure a similar image, with a black smoky aura pouring out of his body. Even their ships, the Saber of Zebek and the Queen Anne's Revenge, share the same color scheme and a few of Blackbeard's crew members in One Piece are named after pirates that the real Blackbeard also personally knew. But he differs from the fictional adaptation in one major way. Something that you may be able to consider a real-life One Piece would be Blackbeard's lost treasure. Shortly before Edward Teach died, he claimed to have hidden an immense fortune, presumably somewhere in the Caribbean Sea or the eastern U.S. coast. Today, his wealth would only translate to a sum of roughly $13 million, much lower than a lot of his counterparts in the pirate world, but on his ledger, he also wrote a note about something else apart from the money. His real treasure. What was this real treasure? We have no idea, he didn't say, and according to Blackbeard himself, it quote, lay in a location known only to him and the devil. Additionally, at one point his ship, the Queen Anne's Revenge, was ran aground near North Carolina and over time went totally missing. At some point his crew transferred to a smaller ship with their supplies and then dispersed. For years, it was thought that this treasure could be aboard the ship, but no one could find the ship either. It took nearly 300 years to find the remains of the Queen Anne's Revenge, with the wreckage finally being discovered in 1996. But just one problem, there was no treasure aboard. To this day, people have no clue whether or not he was bluffing or if this special treasure was even real in the first place, as it still hasn't been found. With that out of the way, let's talk about a guy who, in Oda's story, tends to always show up around the same time that Blackbeard does. 
Oda may have taken direct inspiration from a couple historical figures when it comes to Shanks, and this first one is someone I don't see mentioned much by the community when this topic comes up. Anyway, Red Hair is possibly loosely related to one of the most famous pirates in history, Hayred and Barbarossa, born as Hazir Race and later known as Redbeard for reasons I'll let you guys figure out. Redbeard was an Ottoman Turk born in Greece to a father who worked on the sea and was in fact the younger brother of the real-life Aruge, Aruge Race, who I briefly mentioned earlier. Later in life, he worked under his older brother Aruge, who at the time was also known as Redbeard. Hazir partnered with him as a corsair, which was a type of pirate who operated specifically in the Mediterranean Sea. At some point during a raid in 1510, Aruge, the first Redbeard, had famously lost his left arm, coincidentally the same sided arm that Shanks lost. Later on, after Aruge's untimely death, Hazir took over as captain and inherited his brother's epithet, Redbeard, and quickly grew to become the most dominating force in the Mediterranean. But there are a couple of other minor unique visual similarities between the two, aside from being known for their red hair. Redbeard's fleet was composed of a type of ship known as a galley, boats rowed by oars which were not uncommonly seen clad in the color red, much like Shanks' flagship, the Red Force. The Red Force also takes specific inspiration from another type of oar ship, which I'll get into in a bit. Finally, Redbeard was known for using a specific type of sword common to the Ottoman people, a saber. Shanks' sword and weapon of choice, Griffin, also happens to be a saber. When placed side by side, you can see some of the similarities. Another, probably more likely real-life inspiration for Shanks would come in the form of Eric the Red, a famous Norse explorer known for his red hair, credited with the founding of the first settlement in Greenland. You might recognize his son, Leif Erikson, the first European man to discover the New World. Anyway, fans have speculated for a long time about Shanks and his potential connection with Elbaf, the land of giants primarily inspired by Vikings and Norse culture. From the cover story in Chapter 873, we can see that Shanks' territory seems to have a distinct Northern European theme to it. Yasop is the marksman aboard the Red Hair crew, and his son Usopp has a deep desire to visit Elbaf, but this alone isn't enough to make a connection. However, the Red Hair pirate's flagship, the Red Force, seems to bear some distinct visual similarities to real-life Viking longboats, warships, and even the ships of giants seen in One Piece. These boats were called Drakar, as they always possessed the head of a dragon at the front. Even the color schemes are similar, as real Drakar commonly flew red flags in red colors. The flag on the Red Force features two swords crossing rather than two bones, much like the flag of the giant warrior pirates. Additionally, one of the Nordic gods, Tyr, is famously known to have sacrificed his arm to the beast Fenrir. Shanks similarly sacrificed his arm to a beast of the ocean. When Nordic culture was interpreted by the Greeks, Tyr was rendered as the Roman god Mars, who is by extension deeply associated with the color red. But what about Eric? How does he relate? Well, Eric the Red was a Viking born to a father who was exiled from Norway for manslaughter. His father sailed west for Iceland, choosing to live and raise his family there. Interestingly, Shanks was born in the West Blue. Eric, just like his father, was also exiled later in life, and during his exile he found and explored the land which he would dub as Greenland, since Greenland sounded more pleasing than Iceland and would attract more settlers. Very cheeky. Most importantly, this would prove successful, and the settlement flourished with Eric calling himself the Paramount Chieftain, a title that would from then on be used to refer to the ancient Viking rulers of Greenland. Hold this in your mind for just a second. Why is this important? Because when Brand New introduces the four emperor's bounties, he attributes a unique commanding title to each of them. Blackbeard as a Commodore, Big Mom as a Captain, Kaido as a Viceroy, and Shanks as a Chief. Eric was an explorer, and much like Eric, Shanks doesn't seem to be tied down to any one location unlike the other Yonko. Every time we see him, he seems to be somewhere new, an island coast, a cave, a jungle, a tundra, and so on. All of these things considered, it seems very possible that Shanks, the chief of the Red Hair Pirates, could be directly inspired by the chief of Greenland, Eric the Red. And to cap off our discussion today, let's talk about the Pirate King himself, the man who started it all, Gold D. Roger. There are actually a few people I believe that Oda took inspiration from when designing this character. 
First off, the title of King of the Pirates was actually attributed to a real person known as Henry Avery. Despite his career only lasting a couple of years, he's most notable for landing one of the biggest hauls ever acquired by a pirate captain in a single shot. He led a small fleet of ships and captured a Grand Mughal treasure ship holding a sum of money aboard that was worth around 600,000 pounds, which today would total somewhere in the realm of at the very least 100 million dollars. Even more infamous was the fact that Avery retired from piracy with his loot successfully. He was never arrested, never killed in battle, and got to keep the money, making it one of the most profitable pirate exploits in history. Although a large bounty was placed on his head, he was never found and vanished from all records after 1696. Much like Roger, this world-famous act of piracy inspired a ton of other people to become pirates as well, and even influenced various works of literature. His title, King of the Pirates, was well earned. But then there's another equally famous man named Woods Rogers, a sea captain, privateer, and eventually first governor of the Bahamas. He was especially famous for two things, a successful circumnavigation of the world, something Goldie Roger was the first major character to do in modern day One Piece. He even wrote a book about his voyage titled, A Cruising Voyage Round the World. And as governor, Woods Rogers was also famous for bringing law and order to the Caribbean Sea, resulting in most pirates both fearing and hating the guy. If you were a pirate in the Bahamas, the last guy you wanted to run in with was Woods Rogers. An even more interesting little factoid is that both Woods Rogers and Goldie Roger died at the same age, 53 years old. Finally, let's talk about the guy that was likely the biggest inspiration behind the Pirate King Rogers character and the likely origins of the idea behind the very first page of One Piece, Olivier Levasseur. This man was a pirate who at first served aboard Benjamin Hornigold's ship, the same guy who the real Blackbeard also worked under. After the crew split, he partnered with a guy named Samuel Bellamy, the namesake behind One Piece's Bellamy, by the way. This didn't work out either, and Levasseur went his own way, gathering his own crew and eventually perpetrated one of the biggest raids in pirate history. Him and his men captured the great Portuguese galleon Our Lady of the Cape, which was absolutely loaded with treasure. According to the wiki article, the loot that they acquired from this one raid consisted of gold and silver bars, dozens of boxes full of gold coins, diamonds, pearls, silk, art, and religious objects, most importantly including the fiery cross of Goa, possibly the namesake of Luffy's home, the Goa Kingdom. This cross was huge, made of pure gold inlaid with diamonds, rubies, and emeralds, and was so ridiculously heavy that it took three men to carry it back onto their ship. The crew divided the treasure amongst themselves, with Levasseur taking the remaining gold and silver, and more importantly, the cross of Goa. Unfortunately for him, he was eventually captured near Madagascar and hanged for piracy in the year 1730. But here's the kicker. On the execution stand, just before he was hanged, Levasseur was wearing a necklace containing a cryptogram of 17 lines. He then threw it into the crowd of people and shouted, Find my treasure, the one who may understand it. This is a very real example of a very real One Piece. Keep in mind, even after dividing it between his crew, Captain Levasseur's share was worth over one billion dollars in today's currency. The necklace itself has been lost, but the cryptogram has not. In fact, here it is. Try taking a crack at solving it if you can. You'll probably find that to be a nearly impossible task because much like the Poneglyphs, scholars and treasure hunters alike have tried to decode and solve it for hundreds of years with no success. However, it has been partially decoded thanks to a man named Reginald Cruz Wilkins who studied the cryptogram back in 1947. We now have an understanding of Levasseur's alphabet and according to Cruz Wilkins, we also have some idea of what the code is saying. He claimed that it has a connection to things such as the Zodiac and the Twelve Labors of Hercules, the Twelve Labors actually being referenced by Oda himself through the story of Kozuki Odin, a topic maybe for another video. Anyway, the cryptogram itself suggests referencing the Twelve Labors that you perform a series of tasks in a very strict order. More specifically, quote, the treasure chamber is somewhere underground and must be approached carefully to avoid being flooded. It is protected by the tides, which requires damming to hold them back, and is to be approached from the north. So, 
With much of it solved, Reginald Cruz Wilkins began digging in the island of Mahe. Unfortunately, however, he died on May 3rd, 1977, just before he broke the final piece of the code. This endeavor, the final will and life's work of Reginald Cruz Wilkins has, much like in One Piece, been picked up by his son, John, who is still looking for the fabled treasure to this very day.